Lord. Teach me to pray. Lord. Lord, teach me to pray. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to continue our study on the Lord's Prayer. We had a one-week break, so we're going to pick back up and look at the next phrase in this study. In 1999, Eddie Stanky died at the age of 83. Now, most of you are saying, who in the world is Eddie Stanky? Anybody know who Eddie Stanky is? Oh, three or four people. That's awesome. That's good. Eddie Stanky, according to Time Magazine, was a pugnacious pennant-winning second baseman who battled through 11 seasons for the Brooklyn Dodgers, Boston Braves, and New York Giants. One time, Branch Rickey was interviewed and asked about Stanky. He said, Stanky, he can't run, he can't hit, and he can't throw. But if there's a way to beat the other team, he'll find it. It reminded me of a quote I read one time that said, a man who, doesn't, doesn't, a man who wants, some, wants to do something will find a way. A man who doesn't will find an excuse. As a former baseball player, I can tell you, if you can't run, and if you can't hit, and if you can't throw, you're not much use to your team. And yet, this man, every single team in baseball wanted him to play second base for them because of his will to win. Because if there was a way to beat the other team, he would find it. Well, when we come to this next phrase in this prayer, which is, your kingdom come, what many of us miss, I know that what I missed was the call, this petition, this request. Jesus was saying, listen, when you say your kingdom come, what you're saying is, is God, I want to participate. No matter what it takes, I want to give you my very best because I want your kingdom to happen on earth as it is in heaven. And so as we look at the Lord's Prayer this morning, I want to continue to challenge us. I hope that through this study, God is revealing to you uh, what it really means to pray, what it really means to seek him, what it means to know him. I, I can tell you this, I, I personally have never been more challenged in preparation as I have been through study in this prayer. And so I hope it will continue to be encouragement to you. If you're just joining us, we have been in this series for about three weeks, and we're looking at the different aspects. What does it really mean to pray? What does it mean to seek his face? And so far, we've looked at two phrases. We've looked at our Father in heaven, and then we've looked at hallowed be thy name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And as previous discussed, when Jesus offered this prayer to his disciples, he was changing the landscape. Up until this point, the, the rabbinic tradition had taken prayers like the Shema and the Simona Ursae and it had ritualized them. It, it, it had, had, had basically taken what was meant to be a, a means to engaging and having communication with God and it had ritualized them and they had become rote. And as a result of that, the people of God were not engaging with God. They were missing God. They, they, they were not having the personal relationship that God desires. And God was some being far off in the sky that they did not know and, and, and they did not have a chance to get to know. And so when he offers this prayer, he says, I don't want you to pray these words. This is the example. This is the pattern. He was trying to get us out of vain repetition so that we would have communication with him. As we discussed two weeks ago, the word pray comes from the, the Greek word proshukamai, and pro means to, to face towards. It means to have face-to-face -face dialogue or face-to-face -face encounter, and ekamai means to utter words aloud. So literally, 
when he said, when Jesus says, I want you to pray this way, he was inviting us to have a face-to-face conversation with God. Now that just boggles the mind. And I promise you for the Israelites that day, this was radical because they did not know that they could have a face-to-face encounter with God. They thought they had to go through someone else. They thought that the priest or the rabbis had to pray for them. And so this was radical to them. But knowing this, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, it was clear that this is to be a pattern and not a substitute. And the same thing's true for us. If we're going to get bent into shape, if we're going to have face-to-face and a face-to-face experience with God, then we have to avoid those things which are rote, those things which are vain, those things are repetitious because they lead us into religion and steal away from relationship. And God's desires for us to relate to him. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's stand. We're going to read the text that we've been reading for the last couple of weeks. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read verses 9 through 13. Jesus is speaking. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, there you go, when you pray. Go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father. The word there is Abba, who is unseen. Then your Abba, who sees what is done in secret, will will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they, they think they will be heard because of their many words. But do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask. This, then, is how you should pray. Let's say it out loud together. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father, I pray that you would hear our corporate prayer this morning and the Lord that you would Speak into our lives so that we would learn how to not just communicate with you, but align our lives with you to experience intimacy with you, to be a part of your work and your kingdom, to be citizens of the kingdom of God. Bless this time, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. So in week one, we looked at what it means, our Father in heaven, and how the eternal, sovereign creator of the universe also says, I am your Abba. And as I shared earlier, this was radical because they saw God as this this sovereign creator out in the universe who was really kind of ready to, to zap them if they did something wrong. And so when Jesus enters the idea of he's not just this sovereign creator, he's also your Abba. He wants relationship with you. He changed the entire paradigm of prayer. It was an incredible invitation for each person that when we pray, imagine like this. Imagine that you are a child crawling up into your daddy's lap. That was the invitation. This last week I was sitting on the couch and my enormous, ginormous 11-year-old son who weighs almost as much as I do, his shoe, his shoe now is the same size as my shoe, he comes over and jumps in my lap. And I thought to myself, oh, Lord, help me. And, uh, and, 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 and he, he begins to, to hug on me. And I'm just like, oh, this is so awesome. And immediately in that, in that instant, God said, that's what I'd like for you to do with me. I want you to crawl up in my lap and love me and let me love you. What a picture. What a picture. Jesus was inviting us into our Abba's lap. Now listen to this, to seek his will and guidance. And yet he was reminding us, our father in heaven, that we must always keep a healthy tension between the intimacy and the awesome, between the personal and the powerful, between the meekness and the majesty. We're never to be afraid to enter into his presence, but yet we can never forget into whose presence we are entering. 
It's an amazing invitation. Well, after that invitation, he then says, let me tell you what you need to pray. And I'll be honest with you, I missed this. I thought this was kind of a statement. I didn't realize it was a request. It was an invitation to do something. But he starts out and he says, the first thing you need to do is hallow his name, honor his name, revere his name, worship his name. The first and greatest priority of, of, our, of our engagement with God is to make sure that his name is revered, his word is believed, his displeasure is feared, his commands are obeyed, and his person is glorified. And if you remember two weeks ago, we, at the end, we talked about the word praise and how there are, are seven different words in the Hebrew for praise, from lifting your hands to having holy hands to bending your knee and bowing your hearts to, to crying out with shouts of victory. But all those are imperatives in the Greek, I mean, in, in the Hebrew, which means it's not something that we say, oh, that would be nice, or I don't, no, it is something we are called to do, is to worship God for who he is and what he has done. Well, today we're going to turn our attention to this phrase, your kingdom come. And I got to tell you that the whole reason that I felt led to into this prayer is because of this phrase. A few weeks ago, some of you may remember the discussion came up in your life group about the kingdom of God. Well, since Pastor Art had left, I started working with our small group teachers and I started doing the lesson preps. And, and as I was studying about the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit just kind of gripped my heart. And he said, there's a question here that is so pertinent, so important that I literally couldn't escape it. And the question was, was can a person have a healthy, God-honoring, vibrant walk with Jesus without a solid understanding of the kingdom of God? And after a great deal of study, and after talking to a number of people, the answer is no. You cannot have a healthy, vibrant relationship with God if you have no idea what the kingdom of God is. You can say, well, how can you say that, Pastor? Because the Bible starts out, in fact, Jesus himself said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Well, if I don't know what the kingdom of God is, how can I seek it? If I have no concept of, of, of the rule and the reign of God, how can I possibly find it? It goes back to that old phrase, if you aim at nothing, you're certain to hit it. But, but he says, no, the, 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 the very focus of your life is to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. As I started thinking about that, I looked a little deeper into this call and it's called a priority imperative. What is a priority imperative? It is something that you make first and it's something that you do not, you, you never stop doing. It is the very ambition of your soul. And he says to us, the ambition of our soul, once we have received Christ our Savior, is him, his kingdom, and his righteousness. That we should be in, in a passionate, undying, unadulterated pursuit of who he is, his kingdom, and his righteousness. I started thinking about that, and I remembered back several years ago when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. And at that time, I mean, this is 30 years ago. At that time, the whole idea of the rapture and the return of Christ was really big in the church that I was attending. I don't know if it was in yours or not. But I remember thinking many times, God, I've not gotten married yet. And God, I've not had children. I don't have a family. And I really want your kingdom to come, but can you just postpone it just a little bit? At least let me get married. You ever thought something like that? And yet when you look at this prayer, he says, 
Jesus is saying we're to have a single-minded, focused priority to make his kingdom our consuming passion and desire. One person said it this way. When we pray, we're to ask God to place within us such a burning desire, such a burden for his kingdom that nothing else this side of heaven should matter to us. And so what I think that means is we've got to have an attitude approaching the kingdom of God like Eddie Stanky had approaching baseball. I'm going to give it everything I have. I may not have all the talent. I may not have all the tools. I may not be the smartest, the, 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 the strongest. I might not be the sweetest. But I know one thing. I am determined to make sure that the kingdom of God wins. Because I'm going to give it everything I have. I find it interesting that the phrase kingdom of God doesn't show up in the Old Testament. And yet, it's obvious from the New Testament that people in the Old Testament got the concept. How do I know that? Well, it begins in John the Baptist. The first time we hear the phrase, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is found in Matthew chapter three. And it says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then when Jesus begins his earthly ministry, he speaks about the kingdom. In fact, 86 times in the gospel, Jesus refers to the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, because it was, a, it was a pervasive, important teaching in his ministry. 37 times it's found in the book of Matthew. In fact, it starts in Matthew 4, 17. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what do we learn about the kingdom? Well, first of all, we learned that neither Jesus nor John ever defined the kingdom of heaven. Now, I found that interesting. But if you step back a second and say, why did, it, why did they not define it? It was because the people already understood it. It would be as if I took 20 minutes to explain to you what is America. Most of you have a pretty good concept of what America is, or at least what she was, Okay. We have an understanding. So I don't need to come and explain it to you. The same thing happens here. But I'm not so sure that we have an understanding today as, the follow, as, as children of God of what the kingdom is. In fact, let me get, I, 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 did a, I, I did a small straw poll. I spent the last three weeks asking people, different people, people that I know, people I, I respect, people that I know know Christ, people that I know can't pick Jesus out of a lineup, Okay. I've asked a lot of people, who is Jesus and what is the kingdom of God? And do you know that out of that, I, had, I talked about 30 different people. Out of 30 people, only two could explain to me what they thought the kingdom of God was that actually lined up with what the kingdom of God is. That's terrifying. How can we as the church seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness if we don't know what it is? The word kingdom comes from the word basileia. It means sovereign dominion or rule. In other words, if you're a king, what makes you a king is that you have a kingdom. <laughs> okay? You have something you rule and you reign over. And so the kingdom of God is the sphere or the realm where God reigns and he is acknowledged as king. Now, here's something that's pretty interesting about the kingdom. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom, it is something that has come and is still to come. That's kind of confusing, isn't it? How can it already be here and yet not be here yet? Well, I'm glad you asked. So let me explain. The kingdom of God, the actual, the actual place, the kingdom of God, will occur in the future. When God created the world after the fall, he gave Satan dominion. Satan currently has dominion over all of the earth. Now, that doesn't mean God's less sovereign. It means God has given the enemy a season 
in which he can have limited authority that God has given to him. Now, the moment that one of us receives Christ as our Savior, an amazing thing takes place. We are no longer subject to Satan's authority and Satan's schemes because we are now part of the kingdom of God. And as someone who's part of the kingdom of God, I now answer to a higher authority. And so until Christ comes and establishes his final kingdom, I live as someone who is a part of the kingdom. I live under his authority, his rule, his reign. That's how it is something that has come and is still to come. It's come in me. It's come in you if you've received Christ your Savior. And so now we're called to live in light of that. And so what does it mean when we pray, your kingdom come? Well, the first thing it means is that I will live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am a citizen. I'm a child of God. I'm a citizen of God. And in receiving Christ, this amazing spiritual transaction takes place. I've shared this passage before. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture. But in Colossians 1, it says, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He has brought us into the kingdom of his son and whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. And so two amazing things happen at the point of salvation. The first is that I'm rescued. The word is ruamai. And it literally means to be snatched up. And, and we are in this world of sin. We are, we, we are captured. We are captivated by the culture uh, and the economy of this world. We are under the rule of the enemy from birth. And so when God intersects or intervenes when this miracle of salvation is brought to us and, our, and the scales are pulled back of our eyes and we who once were blind can now see. When we receive him, literally God rescues us. He snatches us up out of this world, out of this economy. And then what does he do? He establishes us. The word is colonized. He makes us citizens of his kingdom. Now, as a citizen of his kingdom, I no longer have to live by the economy, by the, by the struggles of this world. I can live according to the grace of Christ. It's an incredible picture. I thought about this week, Pastor Craig was in Budapest this week on a mission trip. Now, while he was in Budapest, did he need to abide by the laws of Hungary? Of course he did. He lived in that country. But if something bad would have happened, because he was a U.S. citizen, all he had to do was go to the consulate and they're there with their authority. And because he's a U.S. citizen, he is not necessarily subject to all that happened in Hungary, he is subject to, not, to the rule of America. Why? Because that's where his citizenship is. They can intervene for him. Now, that doesn't mean that, that if he went and broke the law in Hungary, it doesn't mean that the Americans went and say, dude, you broke the law in Hungary, you got to pay the consequences. Sometimes God says, listen, you broke the laws of earth. And even as a believer, you got to face the consequences of that. But what it, what it does say is that our authority when we are in a foreign land is our citizenship. We are citizens according to the word of God, not of this world, but of heaven. And God has just put us here temporarily. He's allowed us to stay here so that we can represent him, so that we can, we can be uh, people who, whose lives are useful to help others to experience the grace of Christ. And so our citizenship brings us to a place that when we pray, we should pray something like this. Lord, I am a child of God. Not because of something I've done, but because of what you've done. I've been born again into your family. Lord, help me today. 
as I seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, realize that, that I can do that because of what you have done in me and what you are doing through me. Lord, help me to live as a faithful citizen of the kingdom of God. Is that the way we're praying? Or something like it? That's the invitation. But then there's a second thing. He says, not only do I live as a citizen of the kingdom, but I will also live the commission of the kingdom. See, when he speaks this word, he says, we're praying to align our lives with his mission, his purpose, his priorities. And we're surrendering our aim and our ambition for his. We're in essence praying, God, make your will my will and your kingdom priorities my kingdom priorities. When you got up this morning, what was your priority? What was important to you? When you get up tomorrow morning and you go to work, what is your driving priority? If you are a child of the king, if you are a citizen of heaven, our priority should be the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It doesn't matter whether you're flying an airplane, whether you're driving a garbage truck, whether you're teaching kids, whether you're playing golf as a retiree. He says, seek first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. Steve Gaines, the pastor at Bellevue in Memphis, wrote this. The kingdom of God comes in our lives when we live surrendered to the will of God and when we're dying each day to our own desires. Thus, when we're asking for the kingdom of God to come in, life situ in situations of life, then we're asking that the ruling presence of Jesus that already exists would exist in this very moment for this very season and for this specific time in my life. Why? So that we can participate in his mission, in his will. That's the reason God left us here was he didn't just beam us up to heaven like they do in Star Trek is because he says you now have purpose, you have meaning for the kingdom. So go live as kingdom citizens. Where do we learn about that? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 through 21 gives us a really great picture of what it means to be a kingdom citizen. Listen to this. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced one died for all and therefore all died. Now watch this. And he died for all, here he comes, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ. If I have experienced Christ, the transaction of grace that has occurred in us should compel us because we're absolutely convinced that he was who he said he was, did what he said he did, and it should move us to say, it's no longer about my life, it's about his kingdom and his righteousness. And that's what we're praying. God, help me to, to see this. Help me to understand this. Help me to embrace this so that I can live and participate and partner with you in this amazing commission. He goes on. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation the old is gone, the old, all things have become new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us. Who's us? Everybody take your finger and do this. Gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we beg you, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who knew no sin to be sent for us so that we might become the righteousness of God.
Ministers of reconciliation, that is, we have been given the charge, we have been given the responsibility, we've been given the privilege to take people who are far from God and bring them back to their creator. And we do that by bringing them to the cross. We do that by bringing them to the love of Christ. And then also he says, you are ambassadors of grace. What's an ambassador? An ambassador is someone who lives in a foreign land representing the country from which he comes. And so we are ambassadors in this world representing the kingdom of God that's in heaven. And so whether we're here for a short time or whether we're here a hundred years, it doesn't matter. We're called to represent our Savior and that impacts the way we live. It impacts the way we speak. Now, don't miss this. If I am a citizen of heaven and I have been given a commission as an ambassador, as a minister of reconciliation, if I choose to walk in defiance and disobedience, what does that say about my citizenship? It says one of two things. Either I'm really not a citizen or I'm living in rebellion to the king. Now, I realize our God is a God of grace, and I realize our God is a God of love, but I also realize our God is a God of justice, and our God demands righteousness. So what do you think happens to people who live in rebellion to the king? I'll just let that hang. So when we pray, what does it sound like? I think it sounds something like this, Lord, I'm a citizen of the king. I'm under your rule and your reign. But Lord, I also understand that I am part of something greater than myself. So Lord, help me to make your priorities my priorities. Help me to see people the way you see people. Help me to move beyond myself to care about the things that you care about. Help me to be your hands and your feet and your voice to the world around me, beginning with my family, with my friends, with my church, in my community. And wherever you take me, that's what it looks like when we say, your kingdom come. There's one last aspect, and that is I'll live expecting the coming of the kingdom. I live in expectation that one day, that even though I'm a king's kid, and one day, and, and even though I am already a citizen of the kingdom, his kingdom will come, and I will live in anticipation of that moment. Why? Because who wants to be found living faithless and unfaithful when the king returns? Not me. I want to be living faithfully. God forbid that when he comes back, I'm living in sin. I want to be found faithful. Titus, Paul, in the book of Titus, Paul wrote to Titus and he said this, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Watch this. While we wait for the blessed hope. While we wait for his kingdom to come, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify himself, a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. What is he saying? He's saying we should live as people who are part of the kingdom, we should live in absolute expectation that Jesus is going to return. And we should have our hand to the plow. And we should be living in expectation of that return because we know when he comes that anyone who has not experienced him, that they'll be sifted out into a, in, into a hell and into a condemnation that was never intended for them. Why? 
Because God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but would have eternal life. That's not just a statement for us. That's not a placard that's, that's held up in a football game or a baseball game or a basketball game. That's not a slogan. That is the absolute truth. And it's to that that we have been called to participate. And so if I live in, in expecting the imminent return of Christ, it will impact the priorities of my life. And so what does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? What does it mean to pray thy kingdom come? It means to pray with an urgency. It means to live your life Every day in the urgency that one day he is going to return and that could happen before I finish this statement. It didn't this time. But one day, we're not going to be able to finish the statement. And he will come. And what will happen to your loved ones? And what will happen to your friends? And what will happen to your neighbors? And what will happen to your enemies? The cross of Christ is sufficient for everyone, whether you and I like them or not. And it's to this that we have been called. And when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're saying, God, I want to be a part of your kingdom. And when it comes, I want us to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Little do we know that that's what he said, that's what he meant when he said pray this way. But it certainly impacts the way we pray and the way we live. Father, I thank you for our time this morning. And Lord, this is a tough word. It's a whole lot easier to think thy kingdom come is that one day you're going to return. It's a lot easier to pray for that than it is to pray for our participation and our alignment with your kingdom. Because, Lord, that gets into the details of, of our lives, which <laughs> no longer belong to us once we receive you as our Savior. So, Lord, I pray that this morning that you would help each one of us to, to process and to think through that, Lord, your spirit would, would sift our souls and, and speak directly to our hearts about where we are with you. Are we really desiring your kingdom to come? Or, Lord, are we hoping that you'll postpone it a while? Father, whatever you need to do in our lives, whether that means coming to the altar this morning and kneeling, these, kneeling in this altar and praying, or whether it's sitting where we are, Lord, I pray that we will not escape the truth of your word and the call you have for us to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Bless this time of invitation, Father. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with me? And as you stand... I just want to ask, invite you to, to respond to what God's doing in you. You know, I, I would say that it doesn't really matter what's happening in the person next to you. What's, what matters is what God's doing in you and your willingness to respond to that. At the same time, it's easy for us to say, you know, I, I, I don't have time to do that. Or, you know, I don't know what this person's gonna think next to me. Who cares what they think? What matters is, is where you are with God. And so if God is speaking to you this morning, if he's calling you to alignment, if he's calling you to get some priorities right, Don't give him the husband. Don't give him the stiff arm. Deal with him. Because <laughs> he's dealing with you right now. He wants to work in you. 
He wants to do more than you can begin to ask or imagine. And I know it's scary. It's scary to say, God, I, I don't want to let go of control of my life. The truth is, you really don't have control anyway. So why don't you let him have control because he's the one who actually can control and can guide and can move. Whatever it is God's doing in you today, don't leave until he's dealt with you.